Good morning. All right, so today we're talking about water and electrolytes. But first things first, I'm going to start doing a slightly different format for delivering your weekly PowerPoints. Instead of giving you guys one PowerPoint, I'm gonna break it up into two shorter, much more condensed PowerPoints. Uh, and I'm doing this because I'm trying to improve this delivery. I'm trying to improve retention. Uh, even with the Ed Puzzles, I think it can be difficult to watch 35 minutes of a PowerPoint in a uh, asynchronous format. So I'm shooting for something like 10 minutes, 12 minutes, uh, no more than 15 minutes per presentation now, and you'll have two per week. Uh, I'm going to try to break it up into some mechanistic work and then some practical examples. So what you'll see is this is our first uh, set of slides on water and electrolytes, and we're trying to understand the mechanisms behind uh, water hydration, uh, water movement within the body, uh, and why it can be dangerous to do certain things. And then from there, I'm going to give you guys some practical recommendations based on the text. I think, it, uh, I think it's also important to say up to this point, we've covered pro the most important aspects of sports nutrition, including water and electrolytes. I'll say that where you know, on an everyday basis, when I'm working with clients in regards to nutrition, for the most part, what we're discussing is total daily energy expenditure, uh, running a caloric surplus, running a caloric deficit, um, you know, getting in adequate amounts of protein, adequate amounts of carbohydrates to support uh, activity, okay? That is 95% of what I do. So if you guys have a strong grasp on the material up to this point, you will be perfectly fine uh, working with clients in the macronutrient world. As we step into vitamins, minerals, that is a little bit more specific. And for me personally, that is not what I do on an everyday basis. Okay. So let's talk first, just a few key terms that will help you guys understand what's actually taking place in the body. So the first one is, well, the first three, you hydration, hyperhydration and hypohydration, okay? Uh, and right underneath euhydration is, is what we want. We want this optimal uh, state of hydration. Hyperhydration, so hyper being the keyword, is above, so we have too much water in the body, and hypo would be too little water in the body. Now, I bracketed this off from the last two terms, uh, and these hyper uh the euhydration state and the hypohydration state um, are, are states of being, right? And I say this because hyperhydration and hypohydration can sometimes incorrectly be used interchangeably with dehydration and rehydration, right? So those first three are a state of being. Dehydration and rehydration, right, are really the process. What is the process of getting dehydrated? Are you sweating, urinating, right, uh, rehydrated? Right? Are you drinking water? Are you eating food that has a high volume of water? That's how you rehydrate. It is a process, not a state. Right. So when people uh, say something along the lines of, I am very dehydrated, right? they're slightly incorrect in their wording where they probably should be saying something like, I am hypohydrated, right? below optimal levels. Right? And just the last bracket is really that we're just talking about our water volume in our body. Okay, now to connect this to our next slide, right? Uh, what factors are going to dictate our total water volume in our body? Well, these are the obvious ones, right? Your overall size. A 250 pound male is going to have much more water than a 110 pound female, right? As we age, our fluid will decrease, right? Gender is probably more so, well, gender is associated to body size because females tend to be smaller than males, but it is also very associated with composition. So females tend to hold more body fat than males on average. And because of that, as you guys can see right down here, these are the general breakdowns of, of, uh, of aspects of our body and the total water content. So blood pl plasma is 90% water, right? And it should be, it's a trans uh, transportation system, right? Our muscles and our organs are roughly 70 to 80%, depending on what you're looking at. Our bone 
is 22% water. And the most shocking thing here is that real, uh, our fat stores, our adipose tissue, is really only about 10% water. So this is what I was getting at with females, where females tend to retain more body fat. So, you know, your average female body fat might be, let's say, I don't know, 23% for females, while it might be something along the lines of like 16, 17% for your average ath uh, athletic uh, males, I should say. And because they're holding uh, more body fat, that's less water. So their body's gonna have less water than your average male, all things being equal. So where does water exist in our body, right? Well, it, it exists in two places that can be broken down even further, right? So the first one is our extracellular fluid. And it is just that, the water outside of the cells within our body. Right? And this take, uh, makes up approximately one third of the water within our body on average. The extracellular fluid can be further broken down into plasma or interstitial fluid. Right? And interstitial fluid is the, makes up the majority of that extracellular fluid. Right? Uh, I even gave you guys some numbers uh, of how much water is in a 154 pound male body on average, approximately 42 liters. So then based on that, based on 154 pound male, we're gonna have about 14 liters of water in our body uh, using those percentages. Um, and then for intracellular fluid, we're gonna have about 27, 28 liters, right? So the intracellular is just that, where it's the water within the cell. Right, within the cell membrane. And the membrane is another key word because you're gonna see that the breakdown of water and the volume of water within the extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid is continuously changing. It's continuously changing based on a few factors, right? So it's continuously changing based on two factors, I should say. Hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure. So hydrostatic pressure, pressure is the difference in fluid pressure, okay? So examples of changes in hydrostatic pressure can be something along the lines of um, our blood pressure, right? So our heart pumping. So right outside of our left ventricle, right? That's where uh, blood leaves the heart, right? Out of our aorta. The pressure is incredibly high. So water is going to be pumped from a system of high pressure to a system of low pressure. Uh, another example of hydrostatic pressure would be something along the lines of gravity, where gravity is going to continuously pull our water downwards, right? It's going to continuously pull our blood downwards, I should say, not just, not just water. Um, so that's why sometimes, uh, if any of you ever worked at a restaurant, I used to work at a restaurant for many years, for like 10 years, my family owns a restaurant locally, and there would be plenty of times where I'd work a double on a Saturday and a Sunday, and I'd work, you know, so a standard double would be something like 11 in the morning to, you know, maybe a late night would be midnight or 1 a.m. So I would be on my feet for like 14 hours. And I can tell you from experience that, you know, being on my feet for 13, 14 hours, um, my feet would swell, right? And, and much of that has to do with gravity pulling the blood where it would pool in my feet more so than if I was ever sitting or resting at any given point. All right, so hydrostatic pressure is one of the reasons uh, that we see these fluid volume changes. Another change, another cause for changes is osmotic pressure. So osmotic pressure in simplest terms is the differences between fluids in, in a solute concentration. So when I say solute, right, uh, I'm thinking of the electrolytes, right? I'm mostly referring to electrolytes listed at the bottom of this slide. Uh, the key ones that I bolded are sodium, which is in the extracellular fluid, and potassium, which is the intracellular fluid, right? So sodium, chloride, and bicarbonate make up the vast majority of electrolytes in your extracellular fluid. Potassium and phosphate make up the majority of your electrolytes in the intracellular, within the cell, within the cell membrane, right? So what happens is 
they they exist in different concentrations. So sodium outside of the cell is going to have a much higher concentration than sodium with inside the cell, right? Same thing with potassium, but by vice versa, right? So based on these concentrations, we're going to exist in a certain tonic state. We're going to have a certain tonicity, right? So for example, um, sodium, right, might be in a hypotonic state based on some of these examples that I've provided. So let's just go straight to the examples, right? So let's just say a person downs a 40 ounces of water, right? Just throws that down. What happened is being water, sodium is not changing. We're not increasing our sodium. But what does happen is within our extracellular fluid, the water is going to uh, kind of cool within our extracellular fluid. And we're going to enter this hypotonic state. Why is it hypotonic? Because all of a sudden we have more water and sodium hasn't changed. So if we have more water, same amount of sodium, there's a less concentration of sodium per water. And because of this, what happens is the water, right, in order to achieve our preferred balanced state, water has to swell, right, our cells. And we need to kind of get back to that normal standard balance, right? And as water swells the cell, the cell size will increase above uh, its optimal size, and this can impair function. So you can absolutely have too much water, right? That is a thing. People have died from having too much water. Uh, now, conversely, the opposite end of the spectrum, right, is when someone excessively sweats. So when someone excessively sweats, right, I put sodium does not change significantly because we do sweat out sodium to an extent, right? But sodium does not change significantly, so we are losing a lot of water within our extracellular fluid. As we lose a lot of water, right, what happens? The, the ratio of sodium to water within that extracellular fluid increases. So because it's increasing above our preferred state, we are now in a hypertonic state of sodium, right? So it increases the pressure of sodium in the extracellular fluid, okay? So then because of that increased pressure of sodium, right, water is going to have to be pumped out of the cell to again, achieve that balanced state. And then as water is pumped out of the cell, the cell shrinks. And once again, the cell uh, being below its preferred state, it may actually impair function again. So we don't want too much water. We don't want too little water, right? And you see kind of how it happens based on both um, hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure, right? We'll give you some, or I'll give you some standard application and recommendations in the next slide.